<laughs> where where are you greeting us from, Jay? Um, I'm greeting you from Brentwood, California, but the picture <laughs> behind me is a picture of uh, of uh, the Amalfi Coast in Italy. Have you been? I've never been there, but I've oh. always wanted to go. I've been oh. to many places in Italy, but not there. But since I was sort of trapped home for a while, I try to make my backgrounds beautiful places that I'd like to be. Oh, I like that. Ha have you started to travel? Have you done that since the- No, my okay. wife My wife does not, is not looking to get on planes. She's not looking to go through airports. She's not looking to do a lot of things. So if we could drive, to to the Italy. Amalfi Coast, uh, I think she would do that, um, assuming there was a really nice hotel right in the middle of it. But uh, aside from that, we've we've sort of been home, and the only places we go from here is uh, to our son's school. Where this weekend we're going there to uh, to visit him and watch his he's performing some music up there. So so tell us a little about about your son and where people can hear his music. Charlie Cogan. Mm -hmm. uh k-o-g-e-n and you can go hear him on spotify or amazon or itunes or any place you get music from uh he's got an album at, at all the places uh he's got other singles that he's released that is really terrific you could go on youtube and see his music and hear his music and you i don't know the the demo of your audience but if they're people who like Artists like uh, Billy Joel or oh, yes. James Taylor, oh yes, or, or uh, Randy Newman, oh uh, yeah, or uh, Sting. They, they like Charlie. So Charlie has his music is very <laughs> melodic, is easy to listen to, smart melody, uh, smart lyrics. Uh, so uh, I think most people my age, and I'm in my fifties, would like like his music. Uh, people who might be looking for something that's a little different might not, I don't know, but I think he's a genius and I'm a really bad, harsh dad. Like I really, a critical okay. father. I love Okay, him. no, I wanna to talk to you about that because I was just, I told you, I was just listening to uh, when you and your dad, Arnie Kogan, an incredibly uh, successful, brilliant comedy writer, were on with Gilbert and and uh, Frank Santapadre on the Colossal podcast yeah. and your dad okay so tell us about when you gave your dad a spec script that you wrote for a show he was writing on well i gave my dad a new heart spec script a while back i uh i must have been 15 and i had written uh was writing with a partner i think who was you had a partner at 15 i just you know yeah. kids in high school in my high school in, in van nuys knew about uh -huh. show business and knew like oh if you have a script, you show it to somebody and maybe that's how you get work. So sure. I showed the script of Newhart to my dad who was working on Newhart and he read mm -hmm. it and he went, uh, not only is this terrible, but I think you should be a lawyer. Like he really <laughs> went straight to the idea that, um, oh. that, that maybe show business is not for me. <laughs> lawyer, agent, these are very safe, practical places. Uh, and the other, I think the partner I was writing with that particular script was Billy Ray, who became an Academy Award nominated uh, writer as well. So, wow. So, wow. Um, you know, so what does my dad do? Anyway, I've written, <laughs> I've written things with Billy Ray. I've written things with other screenwriters. And uh, my the guy who became my, my partner for a while, Wallace Walidarski, who I worked with on The Simpsons, we were all went to high school together. So, um and uh, Robbie Fox, who's a screenwriter. So we all uh, uh, grew up together and started writing stuff together. Showed my dad. Now, I know that if I were to read that script today, I would agree with my father that that script was shit. No question about it. No 15 year old just takes a first crack at it and, and sort of gets it. I mean, you have to. You have to it's work it out of the park. But you're a different kind of dad, though. Come on. Our generation is different. I have kids about, I probably around the same age. You came on this show the last time and you had to spend at least 15 minutes talking about your son's album. Well, and... he's brilliant. I mean, what can I say? He's a genius. So I love his music. I love, I mean, I, his music makes me cry. He wrote a song. I would say that anyone who wants to know what my son does, there's a song on the internet, uh, uh, search Charlie Kogan, mm -hmm. uh, K-O-G-E-N, and search the word in between or Charlie Kogan Kennedy Center. At the Kennedy Center- Kennedy Center? He performed in front of 2,000 people um, at the Kennedy Center. 
uh, uh, debuted a song that they asked him to write. They said, we're doing a show that's about vaguely about uh, the, the, the Wizard of Oz, has themes about the Wizard of Oz. And we use one of your songs that we know we like, but could you write us another song that would fit into this thing? And he composed a song on the plane going to the Kennedy Center, to this, this thing that my wife and I hadn't heard and he had never sung. And they didn't have a piano for him to compose on. They just said, you know, figure it out. So he just did it in his head. He wrote it in his head. And then the day that he got to play it at the Kennedy Center, like they had one rehearsal with it, he did it. Then he sang the song and it's beautiful and it makes me cry. And it's about, it's called The In-Between and it's about the thing. I'm writing that that down. It's the moment that you anticipate doing something and you're leaving something else and you don't quite know where you're moored at. And it's sort of the, the thing, you know, the, uh, it's about gathering your strength for, for the task to come and about finding strength at home. So that's the wizard of Oz thing. You know, like you find, you go want to go home and, and, uh, and there's lyrics in it about, you know, about having, wishing that you were stronger, wishing you were, you could get through this thing. And my wife and I heard this song separate together. We were, we had my sister-in-law and my nephew with us and they gave us four seats, but they were separated by one side of the auditorium and the other side of the auditorium. So I was sitting with my, my nephew and my wife was sitting with her sister and we saw the song and it, I broke down into tears to my nephew. And then at the intermission, I ran to my wife, like, through the crowd, like Dr. Shivago <laughs> to my <laughs> wife. And I said, like, tears streaming in my, and she had tears streaming down her face. Like, we couldn't believe our son did this. I mean, it was just beautiful. And we'd be crying like this if it was anybody, but it was even more beautiful for us that it was our son. But this is something you should watch. If I'm wrong, if you'd hate it, if you think it sucks, write to me and explain to me, that's okay. I will, I will entertain opinions that, that it's not the greatest song in the world or not beautiful, but uh, I would like to discuss it because to me, it really, it touches something deep inside of me. Okay, this is my point exactly. Listen to the way, now, yes, I get that it's a brilliant, so I'm gonna go listen to it, I believe you. Mm-hmm. But listen to the way you're talking about your son. Look what happens to your face. Look what happens. I talk to the same own. way about Elvis Costello. Well, I talk the yeah. same way about people. It's Frank Sinatra. I will talk about artists I care about. He just happens to be one of them. Which is a beautiful. I just wonder, did did your father speak of you that way? Has your does your father speak of you that he does way? Now. He does <laughs> yes. now. Yes, he's very proud of me, and he's very uh, pleased I about me. But he, yes. he, he's not at the time when he you're starting out and you don't know what to do and you're mm-hmm. worried about your kid finding security and then you read their script and it's really <laughs> shitty you're like like what do you do do you placate them and say oh no it's wonderful and good job and keep going or do you say this is not good and you really if you're really going to be a, a writer you have to do better than that but consider other options i think that's that was fair of my father it was fair, and it was also a, t- a sign of the times. I do not believe that that is the way we today would speak to our children. I just, I just think it's a di- it's different times. That even if they needed tweaking, yeah, we would be more delicate. I I agree with you. I got glare in my son. I, I I agree with you to this extent that when my father was talking to me in nineteen seventy nine or whatever it was. Yeah, there was a theory that you could go to work at some place and work there for 30 years and be fine. There was a path. Right. The lawyer right. and you'd be fine. That theory doesn't no longer exist for any career or anything. So absolutely. If my son went into computer programming or video game software development or any other uh, high tech thing that there's no guarantee that that would land him security either. Right. So why not say do what you love? Right. There's no downside in the do what you love in this era because everybody's fucked. So, so, just, <laughs> so just do what you love and at least you'll have that. My dad said you could go. There's a path you could go that. And a lot of my friends did go to law school and do this thing. And even if you don't love it, you're safe and your family will be safe. That That's also reasonable. 
It's not, it wasn't okay. for me. Okay, so how the hell did your son get to come to write a song for the Kennedy Center and get to prefer? How did he get in that position? So he, there's this group in, uh, 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 I'm, I'm conflating two groups. There's the, the uh, uh, presidential scholar, there's a group yes. called the presidential mm -hmm. scholar and there's young arts. There's two different performing arts groups. Right. He won both of those things. Like he was big. He got to be big in both those things. So they're wow. like uh -huh. you know, young arts um, is every high school student performing in the in the country tries out for young arts and some get to be finalists. And those people who get to be finalists go to a uh, super finalist round and then they get whatever they get picked and, and, and right. perform in, in Miami, in which he did. He did that uh, too. He went to Miami, but in uh, the in his graduating year of high school, there's also something called the Presidential Scholar, where they pick uh, the top students from every state. There's usually two of them, mm -hmm. uh, but then there's also a scholar, uh, US Presidential Scholar of the Arts, uh, and he became one of the Presidential Scholars of the Arts for his year, and consequently they did a show. He got to perform as wow. a U.S. Presidential Scholar and and got to meet. Donald Trump, <laughs> which he didn't want to meet, and Betsy DuBoss, which he didn't want to meet either, um, and uh, and perform at the Kennedy Center. Did they record it? Yes. Well, that's why it's on YouTube. Oh, oh, that performance is on YouTube. Oh, yeah. I thought another version of it was on YouTube. Okay, I'm gonna. Oh, wow, that's no, crazy. My Trump wasn't at this performance, and well, I'm happy neither was Betsy DuBoss. <laughs> but they take the ten kids who were. U.S. Presidential Scholar of the Arts did their art. Some were tap dancers, some were, you know, Asian dancers, some were uh, percussionists, some played the cello. And so it's a whole show of that. Um, and my son played uh, one of his songs. And they sort of, they try to make it into a, a thematic show. So The Wizard of Oz was kind of the theme. vague theme of the show. Uh -huh. And you'll hear Wizard of Oz imagery in my son's song uh, uh which is wow i pushed my daughter my daughter did the presidential scholar but she did it academically not artistically boy what what an opportunity that's amazing it was great and he got to perform at the county center in front of the you know everybody and that was beautiful and he's had you know he's ha had some good performing experience he, he he could do with more if i was his if i was his momager or his dadager <laughs> uh, i would say you got to get out and perform more and you should need to release a lot more music uh, than you do, but uh, I'm not I'm not in charge of his career. They there are not a lot of parents uh, who would be encouraging that, so, especially since he's at Stanford and he's doing this academic sort of program. Um, wow! Yeah, but he could like I said, like why aren't you playing concerts every day at Stanford? Why aren't you like take your guitar or take your piano or whatever? He plays a million. Go in in the quad and at lunchtime have a or every Thursday, have a Thursday concert and just perform in front of people. Anybody who comes, who comes, anybody who doesn't come, doesn't come, you know, invite the prettiest girls in school to come and then everybody else will come, you know, whatever, <laughs> it's like, you know, figure and, out. And he, and he doesn't do that, why? Why doesn't he do it? I think because he doesn't want to be seen as that, as a, as a, as a, as a, <laughs> as a, minstrel i guess or whatever it is that that he's he you know he's he's has friends he belongs he's a music director of this acapella group that he belongs to that we're going to go see he has he does music in within the school but as a and they all know his his music they all play his records every time i go there they say, we love charlie charlie's music so they all know but i don't know why he doesn't want to sort of promote himself there maybe because he thinks it's what's the point of playing in front of 10 people in the quad and i would think the point is playing in front of 10 people in the quad. Uh, right. So like I, I do improv this Saturday, I'll be doing improv at, uh, at the, the fanatic salon with How my fantastic. Group, the transformers. And we perform in front of, you know, there are four members of the improv group and sometimes there are four members in the audience. It doesn't that's, matter. That's a really small place. I, I saw Larry. Yeah. yeah it's, it yeah. doesn't matter how many people there are mm -hmm. in the, in the audience. We're the fun for us is performing and hearing what last we can generate either, either from them or from us. 
So that's really spectacular that you're still, I love that you're, that you continue to do that. But now we were talking before we came on the air about COVID and not going to the Amalfi Coast because your wife doesn't want to travel. How does she feel about you going into a club and working in a club and then coming home and bringing the cooties home? How does the, that work? The club demands that you have, uh, you know, you, all your shots. You've got to be, have a booster. You're supposed to wear a mask. So everybody in the club is doing that. Mm -hmm. And then when we're on stage, we don't wear the mask, but we do when we're off the stage. And I don't know, it's it's not a perfect system. And mm -hmm. my, my uh, one of the members of our group right now, uh, last week had COVID and was not feeling great. So who knows if they'll be there, but so I don't know what, what to do about that. Either we continue on with life. I am boosted up the wazoo. I have mm -hmm. all my, my shots. Well, like so, dogs now, I have all my shots. That's yeah. true. So I'm going to do continue on with life and and uh, hope for the best. Okay, so let's talk about when it first happened. You were, I saw you pre-pandemic by about six months, four or five months at least. You were working on, was that when you were doing the iCarly reboot? Was I think that had just maybe started to be a thing. <laughs> Yeah, I was working on iCarly reboot, and I, I was also working on Punky Brewster, which was a different reboot, um, and uh, and and a few other shows in between. But uh, yeah. So, so what happened to Jay Kogan's career when the pandemic hit? Were you still writing every day? Were you still doing what you do? No, I wasn't writing every day, and I wasn't. I did. I still don't write every day. Um, <laughs> I write when I have a job, and I have to write. Um, mm -hmm. So. But I, I, what happened in my career? Nothing. I mean, I got, I had to learn how to work from home and work on Zoom and make that environment work as a creative, as a creative place to think of, of, of good TV shows and good ideas. Um, it was difficult and still is. I don't prefer working on Zoom, but it is what we've got. Um, you, and, you don't go into the writer's room at all anymore? The, those days are not, no. Not written to still, no. I mean, most, most, you know, if there was a second there. There've been a few times when you think, oh, it's over. And they've been like, we're going to work in the, and then it hasn't been over. So anybody right. who doesn't have to come in, doesn't come in. And anybody who, um, anybody, you know, on the set, you know, you have to be masked and, and protected as though mm -hmm. it's as you know, deadly virus is is among us which it is for some people so you you have to protect everybody so know. is it so when you do a writer's room on zoom are you is that charge of energy i imagine the charge of energy is different does it work it's much different and it's really weird and the thing about it is when you're in a room you never look at 12 people's faces at the same time Right. You look at one, you know, somebody's talking, you turn to the, listen to them. And then somebody's talking over there, you turn to listen to them. And then sometimes you think about nothing and you don't look at anybody at all. You know, you're the, but that's what happens in a room. Yeah. When you're on Zoom, you can't, this doesn't look good, <laughs> right? So you have to address the room and you have to concentrate on everybody, including your own stupid, ugly face, right? So I don't want to look at my face. Um, so I've learned to actually turn off my face so I don't have to see it uh, on Zoom. But that was a trick I learned way late. So it, it gets exhausting looking at everybody and trying to negotiate who's allowed to talk and who's not allowed to talk and when it happens. And we don't want to talk over everybody, which is like in real life, except it's easier in a room to modulate than it is different people have different microphones, different volume settings. It's, it's just a little weirder. Everything's a little weirder. And uh, three hours on Zoom is like six hours in a room. Wow. So, okay. So have you, so have you had work come out of this situation that you feel good about? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, so, so what have you done? What have you done in COVID that is out there that we can see? Oh, I don't know that you can see. Yeah, Nothing. I've been I've been writing some pilots and some okay. movies, uh -huh. and you, unless you are willing to come over to my house and read it, you're not gonna, <laughs> you're not gonna see it. But okay. um, you know, I've been working with uh, some mentoring some people on screenplays and trying to get their work read, and I'm 
I have some movie ideas that I've been working on, some pilot ideas that I've been, I've written some pilots and other things I'm trying to get made. We're about to pitch some pilots, two different groups of people are pitching. Now, are you pitching on Zoom also? Or are yes. you going, you're pitching on Zoom. I'm pitching on Zoom. I'm not That's only, yeah, but it's not that, I actually like that better because How I can, so? well, I can have in front of my screen right here, I can have all my notes and I can be looking right at them, but still be talking <laughs> right at the camera, you know, like you're know, looking right at the camera. So anyway, it's been going and this is, I'm looking right at my notes. So wow. that's kind of fun mm -hmm. uh, to be able to sort of like have a, you know, cue cards of uh -huh. what you're doing. The other thing that if you have the notes up, you're blocking the faces of the executives who aren't laughing. And that's really great because you don't know you're bombing while you're doing it. You're just like, <laughs> dipping and doing and things. So, so that's fun. Um, I don't mind that. Also, you don't have to drive there. You don't have to uh, mingle quite so long. Uh, so all that's good. Has your productivity changed better? How? Much worse. Much worse. Oh my God, it's worse. Like I, 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 I function, I'm a social creature. So I function so much better in the company of people, with people. Um, I actually hired an assistant to sort of help me through this. And I have not seen her heard that that says, I'm bad at using the assistant. So, um, you know, that, so everything I wanted to use the assistant for to help me with, I, I wound up not really doing. Um, I, I like having an office and not working at home. And when I work at home, it's very easy for me to get distracted or for my wife to say, hey, why don't you take the car into, you know, the shop or whatever that is. And I said, well, I got to work. Yeah, well, you can do it before or after. It's your time. It is your own. That sucks. So like <laughs> really having a place to go and having deadlines about what it is to be done um, is very helpful. And ha it, So have you spent more time? I mean, like I haven't even cleaned out a drawer or gone through a file. I had two years to get my house completely in order and I did none of that. Have you done that kind of stuff? Have you been productive in that way? No, I mean, I think a lot of the COVID gave me a real excuse to sort of not do anything and feel depressed and feel stuck in, in, uh, in a place and look at my life and sort of be a little bit zombied out. You know, I don't know how to, how, so I'm, and I think I'm not alone. I think most people mm -hmm. when faced with something scary and possibly deadly, uh, where everything changed, we're in a little bit of state of shock. Um, and then some people snapped out of it quicker than, than, than I did. And I'm still, I'm trying to be better about it. I just went back to the gym for the first time about two weeks ago. I went to, <clears throat> I'm trying to put myself more on a, on a, on a, a more disciplined writing schedule and doing stuff schedule. But for the most part, I was just sort of like, what's going on? I'm, I'm very good at, when I had a job to do, when I was working on Punky Brewster or iCarly, I, I could write or these deadlines for these pilots I'm making. I could do that, but just, you know, uh, doing writing that I, they writing that I could do, that I don't have to do, very bad at. So what were you, what have you been getting lost in? Have you, have you been binging to do, have you binged during the, how, I've binged how you, on everything. Yes. Did, Food and, and cable and, and streaming. Yes. I, I watch everything. Last night I watched, um, four different things. I watched, uh, uh, the outlaws, which is a brand new Stephen Merchant show, which on, on Amazon, which I'm kind of enjoying. Uh, I watched Dear Evan Hansen and I watched, uh, Mad Max Fury Road again, <laughs> because. Have you watched Ozark? Uh, I watched season one of Ozark and I have not oh. been back. Oh. And I, 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 I didn't dislike it. I just no. know just that didn't it's. didn't go back. I just didn't go back. That happens a lot. I watched season one of things and then I'm not inspired to go back because there's too much stuff to see. So I figure, oh, I've got, I figured that out. I figured, you know, there's obviously there's more to it, but I don't need to see everything i can't see everything so do you are you a binger or do you watch like i'll watch an episode and i'll come back to this tomorrow and watch another one or do, no, I, do you I, I, I start going over and over like I, I fell into i was watching that julia child show yeah. about julia mm -hmm. child so i watched every episode of that very quickly just 
rolled through it. It's not even great, but I just mm-hmm. watched it, all of it. So I don't know. Um, that happens a lot. Where we'll we'll watch the, the baking show, the British baking show, or we'll watch. <laughs> You know, uh, right now, Better Call Saul is, is started mm-hmm. up, which is great. I watched uh, the Slow Horses, which was on Apple. So good. Um, based on a book uh, uh, about the British intelligence, MI5, uh, like the the it's kind of like animal, the animal house of MI5, <laughs> where MI6, <laughs> like they're where all the shitty people go, but they wind up solving a crime anyway. <laughs> so now your wife was home and I'm get I'm guessing your son was also home during the beginning of the pandemic. Were you all there? My wife, my my son and my mother-in-law who's living with us all there. Okay, that so now for your son, my daughter graduated just before the pandemic started. She was early. What was so what year is your son in school? He just became a junior 3 weeks ago. So he, his whole beginning of college was the pandemic. Well, he was there. He was a, he was a senior. I mean, excuse me, he was a freshman the year the pandemic started. So he had, he went through the fall and the winter. And then in March, we pulled him out of school. So he didn't get the final spring quarter of that. He got part of the spring quarter. And so that was his first year was a partial year. It was a two thirds year when he was really enjoying it. And then he didn't go back until the beginning of this year. Wow. Okay. So that had to be challenging. Yeah. So that. was that a good thing? Uh, my son had just moved out right before the pandemic. I was living alone. Was that a good thing all being there? Was it fun to all be there for it? Was, it? it was a pleasure for me. Are you kidding? I like my son, I'd send him away to college thinking I'm not going to see him and yeah. life is changing. And then he got sent right back and like, yay, this is, <laughs> was, was fabulous for me. It's very shitty for him. Oh, good question. <laughs> he does not want to be living in a house full of these old people. He'd much rather be hanging out at uh, any place else with people his own age and his own interest group and, and doing things that uh, young people do, like, you know, those you things know, young people making do. stupid decisions and getting drunk and, <laughs> you know, failing tests and stuff like that. Although my fa- my kid doesn't fail tests, really. He's a very good student. He's an A student. And and this last quarter was the first time he ever got anything less than an A. Uh, so that was a big thing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I didn't care, but he did. He cared a lot. Wow. Um, look at this parenting. This is amazing. Parent. So, okay. So I know you're into food and stuff. What was the what was the COVID experience like for food? Did you guys did you go to the grocery store? Did you have everything delivered? What were you doing during COVID? I go to the grocery store because I'm you did. I shop for our house. I also my mom and dad are older, and I didn't want them going to the grocery store, so I did their shopping and still do. Um, and I also you know we take advantage of Instacart and Postmates sometimes but it's expensive so we'd go for the our own grocery shopping but i i would go in a mask you know ma- fully masked and all that kind of stuff and then come home at the beginning of course i washed, washed the groceries. everything right <laughs> you know boxes of cereal i washed the boxes of cereal <laughs> like a fucking we idiot all, we all did uh and and uh but then but and i was you know sanitized everything and I ran my, my wife, you know, once I came home, I ran up to the shower as if that was going to stop a virus. <laughs> um, so we did a lot of things like that. And even to this day, if I go through an airport, you know, my wife is a like, shower, shower, you know, like, get out of, you know, go through, get those germs off of you. But Oh, so you have traveled, you've air traveled. Yeah. Well, I went to go uh to houston to retrieve my mother-in-law from her houston condo and bring her to los angeles to stay with us for a while um i went on a plane to northern california to see my son sometime on occasion i had to go up there just for a day and i wanted to fly rather than drive um although you, you can drive and we're driving this weekend uh, it's not it's not that hard but i didn't i've not taken a plane like to i would though i would absolutely i would get on a plane and go to europe you know war notwithstanding i would go to i would go to europe 
and or go someplace and I would get on a plane. I have no fear of planes or airports. My uh-huh. wife doesn't like it so much. And since I love her and would like to travel with her, that makes the traveling more difficult. So are you done? Are you one of those I'm done masking and I'm, I don't feel like I need to be careful. Anymore? I mask all the time, all yeah. the time. I go into uh, CVS, I wear a mask. If it's crowded, I'll wear a mask. If it's a market, I'll wear a mask. If it's a big open air play, like I'll, I eat outside still, I try to eat outside. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a re- million reasons to do it. It's fine. I like being outside. It's pretty. I also have an 84 year old mother-in-law whom I'm living with, my 88 year old father, my 82 year old mother. Um, so I don't want to be the like, you know, patient zero giving them any, any trouble. I want to be around to help them. I've avoided COVID thus far. I was going to say, have any of you gotten it? Has anybody? My son did. My son mm-hmm. got COVID. Um, and, but everybody else didn't. And we actually had people staying with us. My son is the leader of an acapella group called, um, not the leader, musical director. He'd be mad at me if I said leader. <laughs> uh, musical director of an acapella group called Fleet Street. And um, they weren't told by Stanford not, they couldn't tour as a group this summer, but some of them got together and just informally took a trip to Los Angeles and a lot of them stayed with us. And turns out more than half of them had COVID <laughs> they stayed with no! us. No! Yes. Um, and nobody got, we never got anything and didn't, it never, it never translated to us, but it's kind wow. of crazy. Yeah. Wow. And we'd had, we'd had no visitors. Like we wouldn't have had a visitor. We wouldn't have allowed a visitor, but Char- Charlie had some friends and was, oh, we want to have open our house up to Charlie's friends. And of course they, they're, you know, dumb kids and they all had COVID or a bunch of them did. Oh, wow. Well, did your son not have a, did Charlie not have a bad experience with it? Was he? He it was, it, you know, he got his in, in Stanford and mm-hmm. they isolate you in Stanford. They put you in like a, in like a little suite and say like, wait here. And then they leave you alone. <laughs> so he was in the suite uh, for a while. The first two days he was feeling really shitty and he was throwing up and like all kinds of stuff, like bad stuff but then very quickly he was feeling much better so um he he got through it as most people do especially if you're younger uh do so he was fine was your wife freaked out that all these kids had been in the house who had uh covid oh no she would never she would never freak out about anything like that (laughs) of course are you kidding i can't even imagine it's like her brain exploded he couldn't imagine it at all. I mean, that they were they were in our house, like you know. It's, of course, it was uh, very uh, upsetting. But there you go. It, it also goes to show you how a the resilient most people are, and b you're not. You know, we weren't spending a lot of time up close with these kids. You know, so it was not like I'm not having you know intimate or face to face conversations with them. So. It, it was enough air and space between us that it, it was safe. I think there's, I, I think it's possible that some people are COVID uh, immune. I think there's a natural immunity that might be happening because I've been exposed so many times and I have not. I think that we all think that. I think I think that. And that'll last until I get it. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'm, st- I mean, I still mask and do all, I mean, I'm so right. careful, but-, but, but there'll be some point. There will be some point when I get it, I go like, okay, I guess I'm not immune. Yeah, but probably. there's part of me that feels like, yeah, like I'm, I'm going to perform on Saturday unmasked and a thing. I think, yeah, I'll be fine. At some point, I'm not going to be fine. So it's all right. So what, um, besides the improv and the pitching, you're pitching some scripts, you're, you're writing, you're doing all of that. Um, does it feel a little bit like real life again? You do going to do improv? Do you feel kind of like you're real? Yeah, that, I mean, that's that feels like real life. Visiting, mm-hmm. I'm having lunches with friends again, which I wasn't doing for a long time. That feels like real life. Mm-hmm. I'm going back to the gym. That feels like real life. So um, what is that like? You don't mask at the gym, I assume. I do. You do? I do. Um, yeah, I do. Uh, and it's fine. I mean, lifting weights and stuff. I try, I tend not to do cardio there so much i spend like the time to go and do the machines and then right. I'll walk outside i'll spend more time outside um and that's that's good um but yeah i try to i try to mask i mean the, the gym also requires everybody to be vaccinated and all that stuff so 
hopefully that's good. And it's, it's not packed, um, you know, so that, that's, that's helpful, but it's, yeah, life is, is, uh, is getting more and more like, you know, we're not, we're not in Florida yet. Like Florida, if you go to Florida or Texas, it's real life. There is nobody, nobody's even thinking about not doing something. It's sort of just like, yeah, we're going to go to the movies. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. I went to the movies. I finally went to the movies. Wow. Two weeks ago. And um, how was that? Well, Did your wife I, go? No. 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 I went with my friend Dan. We saw uh, everything uh, everywhere all at once. Oh, my son just saw that. Did you like that? Loved it. Loved it. It's the thing that I had to I had to see it. I knew I had to see it. So I was going to go see it in the theaters. It was only available in theaters uh, and it was beautiful. So yeah, that was a great experience. And the movie theater I saw it in, I, my, my friend just sent me a, an article saying it's closing down. So the landmark Pico by the wow. Westside Pavilion is uh-huh. closing down. So, so that's real life too, that things are closing, <laughs> that, that, uh, that we're entering a recession, that people, you know, the great resignation of people losing their, leaving, quitting their jobs, but also a lot of people losing their jobs now because mm-hmm. of downsizing and, and uh, tech companies going down. Um, it's going to be an interesting time uh, to have that all in conjunction with the, the, the still COVID still existing. I mean, so many people lost their jobs during the first couple of years of COVID too. People who were in service industry jobs or so it's still with us. that that's still happening. It seems to me, though, that TV and film, I don't know about movies so much because I think there still is resistance about going to the movie theater. I don't think movie theaters are getting the kind of business they did before, but television and streaming, oh my, could there be enough, there can't be enough content. It's, I would imagine the networks are just crazy for content You just now. told me that, uh, that you have Netflix stock, so you are well aware that uh, the content is not king. <laughs> that, 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 well, that that's the... true. I'm getting my Netflix stock is getting <laughs> killed. So, but I, but but, that, but come on, everybody's. But we're watching. It. I mean, I'm watching it every day, which I didn't do before. You didn't? Not so much. No, yeah. I used to go to. No, I used to go hear my friends play music, and I used to go see a show, and I used to go do things. I watched a lot of TV, <laughs> so I still watch a lot of TV. But yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of shows being made, but. There's also a lot of shows not being made or shows being made for, you know, seven episodes or, or eight episodes. Right. And, you know, most of my friends uh, who were used to having full series on TV uh, are not having that anymore. They're sort of like they get 10 episodes every two years. So it's less work for a lot of people. Um, I think and the, and the writing end, the crew end, I think there's a lot of crews are very busy. I think sound stages are very busy. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, that they'll, the writing staffs are, are much smaller. The last couple of shows I worked on, uh, I was just did, re- interviewed for a show, working, helping my friend on a show. There were going to be a total of four entities on the show. So an executive producer, co-executive producer, and two staff writers. Wow. That's a staff. Wow. Is four entities. Now, now I say entities because any one of those could have been a team of people. You could have had a, a, a team of people be the co, co-executive producer or whatever. But that's small. Most yeah. shows in, in my day when I worked at Frasier, the Sim- Simpsons had 20 entities. Frasier had 14 entities. Um, when, when I did a show called Wendell and Vinny, we had 12 entities. Um, you know, it was a lot of, a lot more people on staff to do a lot more shows. Mm. Now they're sort of like, write them all first. And then, you know, we're only going to give you six episodes. Go for it. So it's, it's, uh, it's less work, uh, less money. So things are shrinking down. Uh, they're trying to sort of shrink us too. And that's okay, but it will bounce back because when Netflix goes to advertising, they're going to go back to the network model and they're going to want more episodes of the same shows that are hits, and they're going to need bigger stats for those. They're going to go to the st- to the old model, really? Yeah, you didn't read that. The, no. They're, yeah, they're they're Netflix is going to go to an advertising model, so they're going to put ads on Netflix. It may be like a tiered thing that they have with Hulu. Hulu has with ads right. and without ads. That there's because they need to generate 
they're out of getting customers. <laughs> so now they have to generate money from somewhere else and they're going to try and generate from advertising. Wow. Adver- Hulu, Hulu, no matter what, I always get commercials. No matter what I pay for, I still see commercials. Oh, I don't see commercials ever because um, yeah, I get them at the beginning. I still oh, get maybe, them. At the maybe. Beginning. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the, the advertising model is that people who uh, advertisers want big audiences and consistent audiences. And that's usually from a hit show and they'll continue that hit show. Streaming services that had no advertising want customers signing up new customers always signing up so they keep having to have new things all the time little bits of new things all the time so it's it's a different kind of model so it's better it's better for me for my career as a writer if they go to the where they want a lot of episodes of a of a big hit show then and if you're lucky enough to get on a big hit show then you're great and otherwise you're just hustling to get on another show that hopefully will become a hit I'm exhausted. I'm ex- I am I can't even imagine doing it. I'm exhausted thinking about it. Okay. So Jay, a lot of people who are here today weren't with us the last time. How I, you come from a showbiz family, your father, Mad Magazine, the Dick Van Dyke show, Carol Burnett show, the Newhart show. I'm you, you grew up with that. Was that always your thought? Okay. I'm just going to do what daddy does. You know, I'm going to do oh, what God, daddy I, does. I did not want to do what daddy does. No. So, so my dad was a writer. Mm-hmm. And it seemed to me from my vantage point as a two, three, four, five, six year old, that dad was always, always, always alone in his office doing homework. Mm-hmm. So that seemed really sad to me. Mm-hmm. So that's not the job I wanted. I wanted the job where, and I used to go to his work and see people on stage performing and that seemed fun. And I seen people, you know, directing and people. So it seemed like show business was really fun. And my dad had the least fun job of anyone <laughs> in show business. So what I wanted to do was something in there, but not that. Mm. And uh, so I tried to be an actor and a stand-up comedian. And uh, I was a production assistant and other things. And I wound up my trying my hand at a lot of things. And the thing I wound up getting paid for was to be a writer who sits alone in an office working. So wow. um, oddly enough, that's what happened. But I am more social. I try to do it with partners a lot of the time. I do it with people. I also like to direct. So that's a very social thing. I would love to do more of that. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what um, the, the, the mercurial gods of sh- show business have in store for me. But uh, it's always been like a gamble. Like, what are you going to, what is, what is working in show business mean? It means trying to get a job and not getting a job and then trying again to get a job and not getting a job. And then somebody says yes. And you say, yeah. And then, you know, if you say, if you hear yes, one out of every, you know, 11, 12 times, you're, you know, you're, you're doing really great. So, so what was your first, yay. What was your first job? What was the first time you, you made money? Uh, well, my first job as a writer. Because uh, I've been in, acting, I made money as an business. actor. Okay, yeah. What was your first making money? Uh, my first making money was I wrote a joke. I wrote a joke for my dad who was doing something for Mad Magazine, and he paid me five dollars. <laughs> That's the first time I ever wrote it. And he wrote me a letter from Mad Magazine with a bill of sale for the joke that I sold. Oh. And then uh, the second thing I did was Harvey Corman, uh, who was a, a very talented actor, was on the. Carbonette show asked me when I was 10 to write a page of jokes for him about the Dodgers because he was going to a Dodger roast. So he gave me a hundred dollars to write a page of 50 jokes. And I did. How old were you? 10. You were uh, 10. But I was a smart alecky, you know, funny kid. And, and Carvey was very kind and he want, he, he knew I liked the Dodgers. So I said, this kid could write it. And I think I gave him a bunch of jokes that he could really use. So that was good. Uh, and then I was an actor. I was on the Bob Newhart show. My dad cast me as me, a kid named Jay. So I got my SAG card there. Um, I was in a show called The Bronx Zoo as an actor. I did stand-up comedy, which pays nothing. Uh, and I was how, how did you embark on that, Jay? Did your dad did your dad do comedy? Stand up? Apparently he did, but I didn't know about it until years later. But yes, he used to go to uh, back in the old days. Apparently, <laughs> you you have a party. And then people would stand up and do their routine in New York. And like, okay, 
I've had a lot of parties. I've never had my stand-up <laughs> comedy guys go, friends go like, wait, wait, everybody gather around. I want to do my my hunk for you. That's <laughs> that's what people did back in the, the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And apparently my dad was doing a, uh, a stand-up comedy routine when my mother was at this party on a New Year's Eve and she was laughing the loudest. And that's how they met. Wow. Yes. So, uh, so was he already a successful writer at that point? No, he was a college student at NYU and also uh, maybe also a typewriter salesman. He used to work for Olivetti typewriters and sell typewriters. So no, he was not a professional writer, although he, I take that back. He sold routines to people like Freddie Roman and oh Don Adams mm -hmm. and other people. So he had been writing jokes for them just pages of jokes. He had a file. Was, he would write jokes and jokes and jokes and write bits and hunks for those guys too. So do yes. you know where that came from with him? Did he come from that? Did he come from? No, show he came from nothing. They all came from nothing. He came from his father was a a, a polo shirt manufacturer, and his mother, you know, was a tiny Russian lady, and <laughs> they, they, they didn't know from show business. And uh, no, he did not come from that. But. My dad was, you know, brave guy. And like a lot of guys from Brooklyn and from New York, they sort of, there was like the, you know, doctor, a lawyer, a businessman, and there was called the show business exception. If you were Jewish, <laughs> you might be able to get into show business. We don't know how, but we've heard about it. So it happens. Uh, and so when he was, you know, going to school at NYU, I guess he was trying his hand. And, 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 and tried to do that kind of stuff. And he wound up getting a lot of more jobs writing. And then that job, trans after he graduated uh, and was failed at being a typewriter salesman and failed at helping uh -huh. his father's business, he, his father uh, fired him, by the way. That's another thing that happened. Um, <laughs> kind of like your father telling you that your script was no good. I guess so. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, a, are you, can you see me? I can. I can okay, see you my, fine. My screen went blank for some reason. All I right, can anyway. see you fine. Yeah. Um, this is great. I can't see anything. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so he failed at all those things mm -hmm. and then wound up, uh, uh, you know, trying to his hand at writing. So he wrote those things that, that led to writing Mad Magazine, which he tried to write for. And he read and he wrote for um, like so a show called The Les Crane Show. I, somehow the working on the comedians led him to get a manager and the manager helped him get a job on that. And then the, later on the tonight show with Johnny Carson and wow. that started his career. Okay. And, and so what started yours? So you were doing, you were doing stand up. you were doing, you, how were you, how old were you when you got into the groundlings? Was that a, were you young? 16. Then? I was young. Mm -hmm. I was young. Well, I started doing stand up when I was 16 and I think I got in the groundlings when I was 18. Um, I mean, I've been going to the school earlier, but I actually right. got into the Sunday company when I was 18 or 19. So I was at the time I was the youngest groundling, um, which didn't go over well with the older ground. <laughs> they didn't want, they didn't want to, you know, really? ask, I'm friends with the older groundlings, Tracy and Lynn. And yeah, and, I, yeah. The, the, at the time, some of them was like, you know, in their 30s or whatever, older. And it's like, who this 18 year old? Nobody needs this. So. <laughs> I didn't like me, um, but I had a, I loved the Groundlings. I loved it so much because it was a place where when I went to do stand-up comedy, there were drunks in the audience and people weren't there to see me. Clearly, they were there to do other things. At at the Groundlings, it was a show, and people right. wanted to see the show, right. and so they were happy to see me. <laughs> so, how did you start doing stand-up? Um, I had been watching stand-up comedy my whole life and loving it. I loved. I was a fan of stand-up comedy from a very early age. And I listened to all the comedy records that my parents had. I would go on my birthday. A lot of kids would go to Bowling Alley. I'd want to go to the the the, the comedy store or the improv <laughs> and see comics uh, and see their sets. So I would see all the all the comics and I knew them all. I, you know, not personally, but I, I'd watched them and I knew who they were. Right. And, and I and I knew, you know, how great uh, Bob Newhart was and how great George Carlin was and how great, you know, Robert Klein and David Steinberg and, and uh, you know, Jackie Mason and any, any number of, uh, you know, Joan Rivers and, and, and the, the, just the, the masters of the craft. Mm -hmm. And so 
I figured, you know, okay, take a shot at it. And I would do it. I, the one thing I have is I'm willing to fail. Yeah. So being willing to fail is a very good thing when you're trying to be in show business because you're going to fail a lot. And so in show, I'm willing to stand up on stage and not get a laugh. And consequently, by doing that, I often got a laugh because I was willing to, to try some stuff. So were you, uh, did you do characters? Were you a monologist? What was your, what was your niche? I did, I, well, I did a lot of different, tried a lot of different things. The thing I remember most vividly was mm -hmm. two things. One was I got on stage and brushed my teeth to the song La Bamba. Oh, so you were like an Andy Kaufman kind Right, of that thing. was my Andy Kaufman period. <laughs> and then another one, I got on stage uh, in a tuxedo <laughs> and just complained and smoked a cigar and complained about these kids today. And I did the act that a 55 year old comedian would do, but I was 16. <laughs> and were you successful? Did that go well? It went really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I was doing, I did okay. And that was, that was great. But the, the world of being a 16 year old at the improv uh, and the comedy store was not great for me. And so I much preferred going to the groundlings because it was bar. Like if you, you'd have to hang out in a bar afterwards, the show, and just hang out with people. And there'd be sort of older ladies and you're adorable. And then <laughs> I'd be scared. Uh, <laughs> virgin 16 year old. What do I do with these older ladies? Um, so I went to the groundlings, which was more of a school and more of a more performer. I, mm -hmm. I got better at being a performer. And so how, what made you segue from that to writing? How did that happen? Not getting a lot of work as an actor. <laughs> I, I was working on, I did PA work because I knew I wanted to be in show. So I would constantly re-up my jobs in the summer working as a PA on something or, and, and try to get a work. And one summer I got a job on It's Gary Shandling Show. And Gary uh, and Alan Zweibel ran the show. My buddy, Wally Wadarski, who I went to high school with, we I got him a job there too. So we spent our summer working there. And then we said, oh, let's try writing a spec script just like, and we'll show it to them just like I had with my father. Um, and so we wrote a spec script of uh, It's Gary Shandling's show and they seemed to like it a lot, but they did not buy it. And they said, you know, if you hang out here longer than just the summer, we'll give you a story and you can write it and we'll start your, your writing career. So great. <gasps> so we hung out and they never gave us the story. Um, and so we wound up writing a second spec script just on our own. And that I got to show to Sam Simon, who was a consulting producer on It's Gary Shandling Show. And that they showed that to uh, the people at the Tracy Allman Show. And the Tracy Allman Show read it and said, ah, this is this is OK. Let's give these guys a chance to pitch us a sketch or two for the Tracy Allman Show. We pitched like 15, 20 sketches to them. They picked one. We wrote it. They liked it. And they hired us. That, that wow. was a story. Now, in between that, I had shown those spec Shandling shows to agents and other people who all hated it. <laughs> they all said it's terrible. <laughs> so you, the persistence of just keep trying was, is really the, the lesson you have to take from that, which is, yeah, well, I mean, I just have to find the right person to like it. Alan will be here in a couple of weeks. And uh, I love Alan. And Gary was a mentor to me right. when I started writing for the Huffington Post. He, uh, he helped me with my first four pieces. He was, so I, I think it's now, to, to beautiful. To be fair, it was yeah. beautiful. To be fair, Gary and Alan had promised us a story and they didn't give it to us. Uh, and the reason why they didn't give it to us isn't they were liars. It is that working on It's Gary Shandling Show was work intensive so they would be up writing the show until two in the morning every night there was right. no time to sort of sit down and work for something they had well intentioned but they couldn't do it because gary would take a perfectly good script and have everybody rewrite it from page <laughs> one in the middle of the week and then so it was a lot of extra work going on because gary wanted more options and more choices and more things. And often the thing that was best was the- The first well, thing. Well, not the first thing, but the third thing. Mm -hmm. The third thing was the best thing. <laughs> the seventh thing was not the best thing. <laughs> and so I often, Gary himself on show night would go back to the third thing. He remembered everything. And he would go back to the versions, the jokes and things that we've had 
they had had on the Wednesday version of the show. I can only imagine that you learned a lot about writing comedy being on that set. Absolutely. I mean, man, I, I learned my whole life. I learned about writing comedy from my father, but I've, I've learned and I learned from all the standups I've listened to. And also just the process in the writing room of, of hearing how Alan and Gary and uh, Ed Solomon and Sam Simon and, and, and uh, Janice Hirsch and some you know these really great writers sat and worked their magic on scripts and how everybody had a different point of view and everybody's working to try and make the best show possible. You know, that, that was a, a, that my dad did that for years, but I wasn't able to watch him work in the writer's room like I was when I was a PA on, on those shows. I was just going to ask, so, you, but you would go to, to the set when your dad was working on shows, correct? I would, and I would actually go to the writer's room, but the fact that when a kid shows up in the writer's room, the kid of one of the writers, the work stops. <laughs> That instead of the work continuing, the work actually stops. It's the, the thing that I would I would stop the process that I was there to see instead of like being a fly on the wall and being able to see it. So did you get to be on set like on the Dick Van Dyke show? Did you get to watch Carl work? And Well, and my dad Mary? wasn't on the Dick Van Dyke show, but oh, I, I, I my dad. Why worked, do I think that? I don't know. But I mean, Gilbert really listed it. Gilbert listed it as one of his credits when I was listening to Colossal Podcast. Uh, and I was like, like OK, yeah, yeah. yeah. He never worked All on right, the Dick so, Van Dyke show. So forget that one. So Newhart. So you got. Yeah, I, to... I was on the set of Newhart and I was on the set of the Carol Burnett show. Well, and... Okay. So Carol Burnett, and you got to watch the sketch. Did you get to watch them build those sketches? I got to watch them film the sketches. Okay. You know, and I would get, I would get to be uh, like, I would see the process. When I was five years old, my dad worked on the Dean Martin show. And I, I, my sister and I were, were used as kids, prop kids for one of the songs that Dean Dean was doing for a Christmas show. And there was like all these kids there and it was a lot of fun. So I got to see the process of the week, you know, how, how it all works and how rehearsal works. And that seemed to like a lot of fun. So I got to be there. Even when my dad was busy writing, I was just sitting there with my sister and thinking, this is a great way to make a living. <laughs> so we got, we got to watch, you know, sometimes bits of the sausage being made. And then when we watched the Coburnett show, we were there more as audience than we didn't see the process. We just right. showed up on tape night and they would, sh they would film a dress rehearsal, then a, a, sh a, a show and the dress rehearsal in the show, the dress rehearsal took like an hour and 10 minutes to film. And the show also took an hour and 10 minutes. They did it almost as if it was live and they right. would do it twice. And it was an amazing thing to watch. Amazing. Wow. So, so great. And did your father mentor you in, or was it just kind of through osmosis that you were explain what you mean mentoring like like when you turned in your script and he said this is no this is no good did he tell you why it was no good did he give you suggestions for how to or did he just say no you know what um i think it may have been so bad that there was no <laughs> suggestions to make <laughs> so i don't know <laughs> I, I don't know i mean we later on we wrote a sketch show, a variety sketch show uh, that was like a parody. We called it par parody. And my friends, again, Billy Ray, Wally Walidarski, Robbie Fox, we all wrote this parody show and then showed it to my dad. And he again said, no, this is not good. Um, <laughs> and, and we were older and I thought, well, maybe, maybe he's right, but maybe he's wrong. Um, Cause I think there's something here in that. And I still do actually. I, th I probably was shitty, but um, but the idea behind it was good. So I, I don't know. He didn't he didn't mentor me that way. But growing up, my father would always, you know, tell me to put the funny part at the end. You know, I mean, I would, I would pitch jokes. <laughs> I would not pitch jokes, but tell jokes. Mm -hmm. And my father would say, you know, you can shorten that. And <laughs> he would give uh, the first time I ever brought my wife home to have a family you know, meal with my parents. My wife told a joke and my father corrected her joke. Like he does that with everybody. So it's like my, my, my wife says, people, why are people rewriting me at the dinner table? Which is, was a fair criticism. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's just, you learn by osmosis, no matter what. Was, your, was the dinner table like, and it had to be crazy entertaining and fun at the dinner table at the Kogans, no? Yeah. A lot of jokes being told. My, my mom was funny. My sister was funny. Uh, I was trying to be funny. My wife is funny. My wife was, is a comedy writer too. So like everybody has, my aunt Joni's a comedy writer. Like there, there's a lot of comedy writers and musicians in my family. 
Sometimes that can be not funny though. I mean, it can go the other way, that stuff. Yeah. Some of the comedians I know are not very funny in life. They're pretty serious people, but they see the humor in everything. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess it depends on the mood, right? And the moment. So like people, generally speaking, comedy people are also have sadness. <laughs> so you have, have to catch them in the right mood and the right moment. And often when people are, com comedians are sitting together, they're often riffing off of each other. Mm -hmm. It's not just, they're, what they're not doing is interacting with each other and being emotionally connected. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what's missing is being like an actual friend or somebody <laughs> who feels like they have a heart. But they are having jokes. That joke stuff is, is definitely happening. So uh, have you and your father ever collaborated on anything? We wrote a Mad Magazine article together uh, for the, about a parody of the Golden Girls called something like the Molden Girls or the Olden Girls. I forgot what it was. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, tried to go pitch a show together about a father and son and it did not, was not successful. My father has looked at and given me jokes for just about every pilot I've ever written. Wow. Uh, and given me great notes about them and been in the writer's room with me uh, for a lot of them. Um, Wow. So he's been he's around. I mean, he's really, really funny and super talented. And despite his hatred of my material <laughs> early on, he, he's become a, a, an advocate of mine and, a, and, a, and embraced a lot of what, you know, I was trying to do. And uh, and, and, you know, he's there's nobody better. So I really do uh, have a lot to thank for my father. And I, I thank him for his honesty, too, about the stuff he didn't like. Could you, have you ever done that with your son? Have you ever given him a suggestion to do something differently? Yeah, but I mean, I, I temper it with the, the idea that what do I know? Like, okay, first, let me tell you, I know nothing. Second, let me tell you what I think. So I've done that a lot. I've done that with his mm -hmm. writing, with his music. He wrote this award winning play in high school, a comedy play. He's written a couple of them, uh, and, and they were good. And I'd say like, you know, what is your intention? Some things that were unclear, I would, I would just circle and just say, is this clear? I wouldn't give him what I think should, how right. it should change. I would sort mm -hmm. of say to me as an audience member, I'm not hearing what, what this means. So keep it, don't keep it, but I'm just gonna let you know that it's, it's a little fuzzy for me or this thing. The, okay, wait, the, wait, my follow-up question to that is, and would he take that note and and, Sometimes and sometimes not. The uh -huh. same as me. If mm -hmm. somebody gives me notes and says, I hate this and I love this. Uh, if it's something that I'm, if, this is, if somebody says I hate something and I think, yeah, I was never really sure about that either. I'm much more likely to change it rather than somebody tells me I, I really don't get this and I truly believe in it. I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to change it until I hear it because I, I think they're not hearing in their head what I'm hearing in my head. So I believe in, in a lot of things. So I'm not going to, even really smart, talented people will give me notes about things and sometimes I'll ignore them. Uh, I try to be open to most of them, mm -hmm. and, uh, but not always. Mm -hmm. And the same, and I tell him to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You believe, stick to your guns. If you believe it, you'll see how it works. And a lot of the times he's right, or I'm right, or somebody else is right. Because you just didn't, when you read it, you just didn't hear what they were hearing. Right. Right. No, I love that. Somebody's asking, uh, Estelle wants to know, does Charlie want to act and write television? He doesn't want to act. <laughs> I don't think he wants to act. Um, he, he, he would write. He, we, we've talked about writing together. Um, he would definitely write TV. I mean, I think he'll, he'd be a great writer. Um, I used him as an actor in, on some of my shows. I mean, my father put me in some of his shows. I've, I've used Charlie as an actor in some of my shows. Um, but I don't think that's his first love. And it's certainly nothing that he's willing to train for. Like to me, it tells me a lot, everything that's like, do you want to ever take an acting class? No. Well, then you don't want to be an actor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if you're willing to put in work to do something, then you want to be an actor. And I think he doesn't want to be an actor. He says he doesn't want to be an actor and he proves it by, <laughs> by not investing anything into acting. I think he'd be great if he was an actor, but he doesn't Is it want still to. something that you'd like to do. I mean, oh, if, if yes, yes. What do you got? So yeah, okay. So Netflix comes along and they say, yeah, we've we've got this great role for you. You're you're there. You're My down. rule is, I will do it. I'll, you know, if I don't 
if you want to give me a role, sign to me, I will show up no matter how degrading it is, <laughs> no matter how horrible it is. I'll know my lines. I'll wear my own clothes. I'll be there on time. Uh, I don't care. But uh, but if you don't make me audition, then it's great. If you want me to audition, then uh, then then there's that. But uh, uh, auditioning is hard. But I'll. You it. didn't put yourself in any of your shows, did you? No, I have a rule about that. that okay, what's not, that? The the do not cast yourself in any of your shows, uh, because you're working. You right. have a job. Uh -huh. You're taking a job away from an actor, so. I would cast myself so much that I would take jobs away from all these <laughs> actors and that would be bad. So I had to put a limit on it and say, yeah, don't, <laughs> don't put yourself in anything. Don't cast the writers in too much. Give professional actors a shot to work because nice. that's what they're trying to do and why take away their moment. Okay, so it starts out Tracy Ullman and The Simpsons grew from that. We all know that that's where The Simpsons came from. So. Did you, as soon as The Simpsons started to be, did you go with that? Did you make that transition then? We worked on the Tracy Ullman show and The Simpsons at the same time. Oh, wow. And then, and then when the Tracy Ullman show got canceled or decided to retire, whichever it was, mm -hmm. then we worked on the, the, the Simpsons full time. And before The Simpsons became its own show, did you guys have any idea what you were about to be a part of? Did you, could you tell? We knew people liked it. We knew people were laughing at, at the little cartoons in between. That was really uh, clear. And so making the show from The Simpsons seemed really fun. Like we're, we had been writing sketch shows and uh, little sketches that were two people, three people, four people sketches, uh, one set. And that's fine, writing little plays, mm -hmm. great. Then when you got a chance to write The Simpsons, it was like, you can write the craziest movie you've ever thought of with as many sets and as many people and as many action sequences and stunts that you can possibly think of. And you go like, wow, that's completely freeing as a writer. He goes, okay, let me have anything. I think of anything volcano exploding. Yes. You know, football stadium full of thousands. Yes. Whatever you wanted to do. And even, you know, for half a page, absolutely. For a quarter <laughs> of a page. So it's, it's an amazing. What an amazing freedom to, to do that. So was that the most fun you've ever had? I mean, it sounds like it would be the most no, fun. You could sex no, sex was the most fun I've ever had. But after that. <laughs> I mean, on writing on, for TV. Okay. okay. Uh, no, I, I, I really enjoyed working at The Simpsons, but I really enjoyed many things that I've done. And okay, so as, tell, us, as tell, us, tell us some of your favorite shows to work on because you've worked. Knock Them in the Middle was, was oh. a pleasure to work on. I loved working with Linwood Boomer and that group of people. And that's one of the highlights of my life is to work with those people. The Frasier people was one of the highlights of my life to work with those people. The Everybody Loves Raymond people was such a pleasure to work with those guys. Uh, I worked on a show called Wendell and Vinny. That was my own show. Okay, and now I that I read was based something on your wife. Is your wife, did something come from that? Well, it was based on my life. The, the show was ostensibly about a little boy who was a super genius kid who uh, an uncle basically got custody of. Uh, and next door neighbor was this girl that he loved, uh, that the, 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 uh, the uncle had the hots for and his sister, uh, very judgmental, didn't like how the uncle was, was raising the, the adopted boy. Okay. So that's the show. Okay. In the show, based on the show, I'm the uncle. My son is the kid. He's not adopted, but. He's much smarter than I am. He always was super genius. And I always felt like, oh, well, I'm not capable of, of keeping up with him. So I had, that was an expression of my life at the time. Mm -hmm. And the hot neighbor next door and the judgmental sister were both my wife. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> like two sides of my wife. So, and so I, I knew how to write that show with my eyes closed. Like I, it, it was instantaneous what that show was uh, because wow. it was my life and, and, and I understood everything. Um, so yes, it's, it's about, it was about my experience having this really, really smart kid and having a smart kid is the same thing as having a special needs kid. Um, because you just, they are special and they have special needs and, uh, they have difficulty understanding an unfair world <laughs> that, that, that doesn't work necessarily in a logical and, and uh, smooth way. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very tender 
uh, operation to sort of not screw them up to uh, to make them horrible people. Uh, so that was my my goal was to not be the person who screwed up my kid. <laughs> I think I was, you've done quite well with that. It sounds like they have so much potential. Like you can only be. You know, if they succeed, this really handsome, smart, talented kids, if they're a success, that's not a shock to anybody. But but if they're not, that's your fault as the parent. That always goes to you. So you can only <laughs> there's only a downside to, as a parent. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so so, Jay, if if you're doing all this stuff now, you're putting all this content out there. You're, yeah. But you're also doing improv. It's, so did you stay doing improv all through the years while yes. you No. Always have. Wait, always have, said- always will. Again, there's a show, it's the Groundlings, called Cooking with Gas. I do, or Crazy Uncle Joe, I'm a guest. I will guest at anything. Like, I love performing. So I'll do it. And I think I'm pretty good at improv. So I'm happy to do all that stuff. Uh, and, and I love doing it. So I, anytime, I don't think watching improv is so fun. But doing it's really fun. So, so I will go anytime, anywhere. So have you ever considered writing a, a sketch? Yeah, like, or, or, well, I mean, you can't, but, but have writing that kind of, sh- creating that kind of show as a vehicle for yourself. What is that kind of show? Like, like Larry David's show? What is an improv show? Not an improv show. I guess more of a sketch show than an improv show, I would think. Well, Tracy um, was a sketch show, but I yeah. mean, no, it's, it's not, I mean, yeah, I've, I, I, I can, I would work on sketch shows if that was the thing. I don't know. I mean. But what about doing what Larry did? I mean, Larry was a stand-up comic that only the comics laughed at and right. he wrote this vehicle and I mean. Yeah, but he's it's still writing. I mean, those, those, those shows are written. I mean, everybody mm-hmm. says they're improvised. They're not improvised. No, they're of written, course. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're written, they're, they're outlined, very detailed outline about what is supposed to happen in each one of these scenes. They cast actors who have to impart certain bits of information. Um, certain jokes are already written down. I mean, it's right. just, they have, they've written the show. They just didn't, you know, they don't make everybody memorize the full script the whole time. So um, I don't know. I could do that, but I also like, knowing that there's a script. I also like knowing there's what the jokes will be. And if I could kind of figure it out beforehand, I feel more comfortable uh, rather than relying on not. I mean, Larry's show is all about um, a strange situation, uh, you know, getting blown up and which is great. Um, and, and that's what Seinfeld kind of was about, like petty, petty, weird, strange situation. Um, that's fine. I. I tend to write shows that have a little bit more heart mm-hmm. and a little bit more, you know, emotional connection. Mm-hmm. So maybe that makes it less funny, but it's somehow more meaningful no. to me. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. Well, so, no. so it's a little different, but I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's not, I could, I would love to work on uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm if uh, the, you know, I turned down Seinfeld twice, but I would, I would definitely work on. And why the, did you, why did you do that? Why did you make other choices? Um, I had other uh, different opportunities. Like the first time I, I got or offered Seinfeld, I was offered Seinfeld and the single, I was so, Seinfeld, Frazier and the single guy. And NBC said, if you do the single guy, we will give you a put pilot. We'll make sure your pilot gets made. And uh, that was wow. worth a lot of money. And I said, okay, well, I guess I'll do the single guy. And then I quit the single guy after the first year. because it was so uh, difficult. And then... I got offered again, Seinfeld and Frazier. And then I had to choose between those shows. And I had come from some, the Simpsons and I thought Frazier would be a whole different color mm. than, than the Simpsons. And I thought, okay, well, that's, it's just a better, it's a, it's a, it's just, the, the Seinfeld is like the Simpsons only in live action. It's silly and football, you know, funny and big, uh, but, Frasier is different. So I, I thought I could learn more by going to Frasier. Did your father immediately appreciate your success? I imagine that he did. Yes. He loved it. I mean, when I first got a job on the Tracy Holmes show, he was thrilled. It was fantastic. It was like uh, he, he was 
loved it. And when I won my first Emmy, he was I was going to say winning Emmy awards. And, and, and I think you have one more than your father, don't you? I do. And he's <laughs> not in the least jealous. He oh, loved it. He's, he's thrilled for me. So yeah, no, this is, it's a, it's definitely a love affair at the Kogan's. That's, that's not a, there's not a, I feel very supported by him and all the people who helped me growing through life, including Alan Zweibel and Gary Shandling and, and, you know, Gary, you know, we talk a little bit about Gary. Gary was a very supportive guy to a lot of people mm -hmm. um, and including me. And he took me seriously as a writer, even though I was getting him yogurt. <laughs> you know, it's like he would talk to me very seriously about what it would take to be, you know, what a success is and, mm -hmm. and give me in part lessons. And that was, I was always appreciated that. And I always appreciated him through the years. He mm -hmm. stayed in touch with me and it was always uh, uh, there, you know, and it's, it's an interesting guy too, to, you know, knew what was funny always, not always the happiest fella, but mm -hmm. always really smart and really funny. I heard you tell a story about, I know he spent a lot of time in Hawaii and he was, go ahead, you tell the story. Well, I was there with a girlfriend and we were, we were at this, uh, this resort, Kanapali, I think. And he, Gary was there with Linda and his, his longtime girlfriend. And mm -hmm. I don't know if they weren't getting along, but he was constantly asking me to hang out with him. <laughs> it's like, it's a very romantic place. Mm -hmm. So he was constantly asking me to, to like ditch my girlfriend and, and just hang out with him all the time. And I did it a couple of times. And eventually I said, you know, I'm, I am here with my girlfriend. So I probably should spend some time with her. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that he always talked about was how much he loved the, the sunset and how much the Hawaiian sunset was his favorite. He was always thinking that it's going to be the perfect sunset. And every time we would watch the sunset go down over a couple of nights in this trip, he'd always go, this is pretty good, but not quite right. <laughs> it's like, it was not, it couldn't have been perfect. Like it was a perfect Hawaiian sunset. There's like palm trees in the ocean and it's, the sky is turning orange and the sun is setting behind an island and it's really, couldn't have been more beautiful. And Gary's like, it's, it's close. It's almost. <laughs> and, and that bespeaks like Gary wanted to find that, that sense of, of peace and belonging. And, and he worked at it, but he never you know, rarely mm -hmm. maybe got there. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, it, do you consider your life a happy life? Uh, unless you're telling me something I don't know no. what's going on. <laughs> yeah, my life is fabulous. If I drop dead tomorrow, I'm got so much more out of it than I deserve. I mean, how great. I've had this wonderful, fun job. I have this great family. I've got a great wife. I've got, uh, you know, pretty good tech abilities with Zoom. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot to be grateful for. Uh, uh, but no, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, Generally speaking, a, a happy guy. I have moments of, of sadness and depression. Yesterday, between the hours of one and three, I was really sad. Don't know Do why. You, really? <laughs> I really was. Uh, I, got, I just, I was laid low by some sense of sadness that went away between me meeting somebody for lunch and me meeting somebody in the afternoon. And I went, okay. So meeting with people really makes me happy, apparently. Mm. That sounds like a good plan. Yeah. Well, Jay, thank you so much. So, all right. So wait, before we go, it, you have a bunch of things out there. Is there one thing you're really, is there one thing that you would love to happen right now next? Uh, well, I'm about to sell, trying to sell a few projects. I'd hope one of the 20 of them <laughs> goes. So I have something to do. That would be good. Um, I'm also looking for a, uh, my son's coming home for the summer and I need to find him a job. So if anybody out there has a music industry job that you want a, 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 a really talented songwriter, but he's willing to be just slept coffee or do whatever it is, you know, it, it could be a, a really shitty job. That's OK. But he he'd like to have some kind of internship or, you know, worker job that in an industry that he's hoping to go into which is the music industry. And speaking so, of which you mentor people, how, does that happen through teaching at USC? Who, who do you mentor? How does that happen? People come to me and mm -hmm. ask me if I can read their script and help them. And often I do. I mean, it comes to not, if I have time and, and the ability I do, but I've been trying to, to go for um, 
people of diversity, people who haven't had a shot, people who don't, you know, I grew up with a dad in the industry. I'd like to be their connection to the industry in that way that my father was. I want to sort of make it more real and say, okay, here's what it is. And so I helped them, you know, I helped them with scripts. I helped them, you know, they asked my opinion about scripts, but also just like, what about this manager? How do I get this, the script to this person? What's my plan of, of trying to sell this thing? And uh, uh, so I, I help, I helped them with that too. Like I'm trying to be like, like a, a, a guide as best as I can to help them achieve their dreams. And it's very satisfying to watch these, these people grow. But I do the same thing with my students at USC. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm teaching a sitcom class. I just taught a sketch class where we made like a Saturday Night Live style sketches. And so I'm there for those students, but, but I'm more, I'm also there for people who have nothing to do with USC, who just need a helping hand and who reach out. And if I can do it, I will. Thank you, Jay. I, that, that's a really beautiful thing. Um, it, it's lovely to hear. And, uh, and I hope that- Better than going to the gym. <laughs> More fun, certainly. More fun, yes. Well, I hope that comes full circle for you and, and somebody does the same for your son. And I, I, I have a good I'm, feeling that'll happen. I'm sure pe people have been nice to him and that's been always great and learning from. Now we just have to find like a, a place to park him so he can be worked, work to the bone and see what it's like. I know a few people that might be able to help with that. We'll talk. We'll talk after. Okay. Thank you so much Thank for you. doing this. Jay. It's been great. Pleasure is Thank you so much. Have a okay. wonderful evening. And I hope right. that it's only sunshine and happiness this evening. Okay.